Hello everyone, my name is Professor Mark Baines, and this is Exercise Physiology for Sport with Concordia University. This is week one of our semester, and today we're talking about common measurements and control of the internal environment. With that said, starting first and foremost with the concept of uh, the goal of exercise physiology. The goal of the application of exercise physiology is the understanding of how to apply concepts in assessing performance specifically, then increasing performance to actually improve before the next assessment, obviously making sure the assessments are appropriate. Uh, having a cycling test for a runner doesn't make any sense, just like having your running test for a swimmer makes no sense. This test has to be significant for the performance itself. If we're talking about fitness in general, well, we can use any number of tests. We're talking about athletic performance though, that test needs to be very, very specific toward the performance we're looking for to see improvement in our sport or our athletic endeavor. That said, of course, beyond that, the goal is to prevent chronic problems and disease, not have major issues of health-wise that affect our performance long-term or anything that we're doing for performance sake right now. We wanna ensure the best of our ability as coaches with a greater ethical and moral responsibility to take care of our athletes, not just beat them up for the sake of hoping the strongest survive and perform well and everybody else, oh well. That is definitely not the goal of exercise physiology, where we are studying uh, to the best of our ability with the information we have, the effects of exercise or exertion during exercise and after. And because we're looking at after, we're also technically looking at before, since there's all that time between uh, se exercise sessions of any kind. Okay, So it's pretty broad, uh, but we're going to do the best we can to take this information and make it usable, make it applicable. That is the primary goal of this course, to make it useful for us as coaches of our athletes. Uh, and that said, uh, first understanding of the concept of strength versus power. Right off the bat, your uh, book is referring to concepts of strength or power or endurance, and everything is strength. You know, everybody, everything is the ability to produce force, which is what strength is. Maximum strength, the maximal capacity to produce force for a given muscle. Right? And of course, we talk about um, movement in general. Now we get into movement efficiency, which has a role that plays with, with strength as well. We'll come back to that shortly. Power is the ability to exert force quickly. Of course, endurance would be the ability to, to exert force over sustained efforts or longer periods of time. We have to be clear about what parameter of strength we're looking to assess because with that, we want to perform at a higher level with that particular parameter of strength. Okay? Uh, that said, Oftentimes we talk, refer to calories uh, in the fitness fields or in sports related fields. And calories, what it really, calorie really is, is the measurement of how much heat is required to eat one kilogram of water one degree Celsius, which honestly doesn't have a whole lot of merit for us other than understanding, generally speaking, about how many calories someone might use on a given day for purposes of exertion and able to maintain the metabolism. The only way you can really get an accurate measurement of this is either through direct calorimetry, which you're in a, basically in a vat of water. <laughs> you can only do that for so long and actually measuring body heat. Uh, we, in, we often use indirect measurements whereby you have, you're measuring oxygen consumption and carbon dioxide output with a mask on you. Um, and if you want to measure it from a general standpoint, well, we'd have someone laying down in an almost reclined position and they're basically breathing in and out normally as they would during a typical day uh, at rest. And they are actually will measure then for that nine nine minute range. Total test is about twelve minutes long, uh, and that is a reasonable measurement of your resting metabolic rate. That said, if the goal is to measurement nor toward exertion, well, we want the person to exert as it would be in their performance. So again, ideally, they're running if they're a runner, they're cycling if they're a cyclist, and they're swimming if they're a swimmer. Obviously, every sport we're endeavoring, or we're actually uh, utilizing here, or talking about here with uh, athletic performance, is going to be either on land, on a bike. Or in the water. So I want to use a test that's most, most applicable for you. That said, American College of Sports Medicine also tries to measure as best that we can exertion as it relates to metabolic equivalents or METs. And it's not a bad concept for talking about something being low exertion, moderate exertion, or high intensity exertion to give people a better idea about how hard they should be working to get the benefits of exercise. That said, we'll talk very briefly about that. We're going to talk a lot more in terms of what the person is capable of now, regardless of METs or calories, and want to see that performance improve. How do we do that? We have to be clear about what our goals are, once again, for the performance, what, what performance parameters we want to see improvements in, and then how do we assess properly to get an understanding of what's not performing at a high enough level that we need to work on. That's the whole goal of performance assessments. And a lot of people do not use them, which is really highly unfortunate and really kind of hard to understand, uh, as well as not, not understanding how to utilize those tests for the improvement of performance. That's what we're going to explore over the course of this course. Over the course of this course, yeah. That said, 
Energy expenditure or oxygen requirements during steady state exercise is about the only way we can really get a reasonable understanding of what someone's actual energy output really is. Which means, generally speaking, over the course of a day, there's no way of really knowing exactly how many calories you burned. It's all estimations, and it can be off anywhere between a few percentage points and 20, 30% plus. Uh, it's fair to utilize them if it's motivational for someone. It's not fair to utilize it for actual recognition of someone's actual caloric output on a given day. Okay, very important to understand that. But that said, exercise efficiency. I mentioned a moment ago or a few moments ago that strength is not just about the ability to produce force, but mechanically from the joint motion itself, whether it's the elbow motion, or shoulder, elbow, wrist, fingers motion, uh, motion of the hips, spine, shoulder, elbow, hand, fingers, right? Uh, any number of different motions that are being incurred in a given exercise are have a significant relationship to the efficiency of that movement, depending upon the person's coordination, their capabilities, their movement control. Uh, that said, you can actually not necessarily be super strong, but because you move very well, your exercise efficiency is at a very high rate, meaning it doesn't take much effort to move fairly well for you then you would appear to be, quote, stronger, when really it's an issue of coordination, neural recognition between the nervous system and the muscular system. We want to make sure that when someone's, you're seeing someone's gains from training in the first eight weeks or less, really, uh, six weeks or less, for sure. We're not talking about hypertrophy, like muscle size change. And that's not what that is. It's better communication between the nervous system and the muscular system. So any gains that are made in a six-week period, four to six-week period, are going to be more neural, uh, basically endocrine or nervous system related. Six weeks plus, now we're starting to see the changes coming from more actual muscle change consequently, and that's related to now force production uh, from a muscular standpoint, not just efficiency of movement as a whole. And if you want something to be more efficient as a whole, we have to take into account the work rate, right? The amount of wattage, power output, uh, the speed at which you're moving, and of course the muscle fibers involved. There are three muscle fiber types. Type one, the endurance related fibers that are red, they can go for longer periods, typically talking about exertion levels two, three plus minutes and beyond, typically more towards type one muscle fibers, or we're talking about output that is somewhere between 60 to 70% maximal force output or less, can be mostly type one muscle fibers involved in that exertion for those movements that are being incurred at given joints. Uh, type 2A muscle fibers, more pinkish in fiber, more moderate fatigability, more moderate force production capability. They can do more work, but they can't do it for as long. We're talking about exertion level whereby you're maximizing exertion between about roughly speaking 30 seconds. Your textbook might even say as low as 10 seconds. About 30 seconds ish to about two or three minutes. Mostly type 2A fibers. Anything that you can do for at least that long, 10, 30 seconds or more, but can't really go more than two, three minutes where you start seeing significant fatigue and drop in performance. We're talking about exertion level between like 70 to 85%, 90%, somewhere in there. We're talking about type 2A muscle fibers, okay? And those muscle fibers are mostly doing most of the work during those work periods. Anything that's one to 10 seconds, you can go a little beyond that, 15, 20 seconds maybe, but definitely one to 10 seconds. And your maximal output, those are type 2B, often referred to as, but now really type 2X. It's really the more common usable term for muscle fiber involvement for those really short bursts of power, maximal force output from a standpoint of either strength, which is slow, low velocity, slow speed, or power, high velocity, which can require high force production, but low load. We're gonna come back to these concepts a lot, okay? You must take into account when you're talking about efficiency, how hard is a person working? Not just exertion-wise, that's RPE, rate of perceived exertion from the standpoint of subjective, subjective uh, interpretation of performance. Objective interpretation of performance is going to relate to the actual performance itself. How well are they moving? Um, how efficiently are they performing the motion itself from the standpoint of not exerting more than is needed, right? Which can relate to strength, flexibility, coordination. Numerous factors can affect exercise efficiency, right? Anything that helps you move better is going to help you improve exercise efficiency. And that's going to be a lot of things that we can do with that. Speed, how fast you move. Unfortunately, what happens for a lot of us with power athletes, we think everything has to be fast. That's just not true. The only time you're working on actually being faster, as with a movement standpoint, when it comes to loading, is during power, right? Uh, maximal speed. That's your goal? Fair enough. Trying to perform maximal speed with overhead press or an arm curl or a leg press, that doesn't make a lot of sense because the loads are higher. If the loads are, in fact, higher, uh, they actually the low velocity is going to improve the strength because the high velocity is going to incorporate more momentum and get less benefit from the strength exercise as a whole, right? We'll come back to that more and more over the course of the term as well. And that said, take all those factors into account when talking about efficiency. And how efficient someone is from the get-go is going to have a strong relationship toward performance 
long term. Your true goal should be number one before you even worry about how much strength, how much power, how much endurance someone has. Do they move well? Do they have high exercise efficiency? Are we maximizing each muscle fibers in Almond? Can they move at variable speeds when required to do so? And uh, are they able to perform high levels of uh, performance at less levels of effort? Those are all good things. Okay. A lot of times we had a big mistake, and this could be a common mistake many of you are going to make in your discussion board posts, and I'm going to call you out when you do it, when you start saying it's actually better to exert higher level effort. Not necessarily. And actually, not necessarily. From the standpoint of, wouldn't you rather have someone perform at a high level without much effort? To put it bluntly, Usain Bolt, fastest man in the world for a number of years. Now, this next couple of years will be somebody new since he's retired. That said, though, almost guaranteed, his heart rate would be at the lowest of probably of all his competitors. He's probably exerting less effort than all the other competitors, and yet he's still faster. It does not mean the goal is to exert less effort. It means to be efficient in exertion, far more important than the exertion itself. Okay? I'm going to come back to that. All right? Running economy. Uh, when you're comparing uh, one runner, uh, a runner at different speeds, we can see different levels of economy, uh, how much effort is actually required at a given level of effort. That's what we're talking about. Exercise efficiency as a whole relates to more steady state, trying to determine exactly what's going on. We want to be efficient the more and more we're involved in any level of exertion. But running economy, we're talking about comparing you at variable levels, you, you as an individual athlete or your athlete individually, um, with uh, other runners at the same speed or comparing your, your running economy at one rate versus another rate, okay? That said, it's got to be a fairly steady state uh, exertion level to actually fully understand that. And it's more useful for more endurance type sports than anything else. Although you could argue efficiency and economy as a whole is going to benefit all athletes. How much? That's what we have to decide over the course of this uh, entire class uh, and for you with your athletes. We're going to keep discussing those points each week. Homeostasis. The primary goal of rest after exertion is to return that body toward homeostasis as soon as possible. Homeostasis is a constant internal state. Now, steady state is also a constant, uh, or actually it's a current steady state, and that could be any variable. You could be in a steady state at a higher level of exertion, whereas homeostasis is only accomplished when you're at full rest. The primary goal is to see a person respond very, very quickly to resting state as fast as possible. The faster you can get your athlete back to a resting closer to homeostasis state following exertion, the more performance effort they're gonna be able to give to you the very next set. It's commonly misunderstood. A lot of people shorten those rest periods with the concept of thinking that somehow we're working people more efficiently by working them harder with short rests. Not so. What's the goal of the exercise? How do we be sure that we're actually getting the proper level of, of output, not just effort, but actual force output? Well, we have to make sure we're getting that person enough rest to be able to do it. Not just, we've decided arbitrarily, here's the number you have to meet. There has to be a reason for it, and there has to have exercise physiological background to that before we start making these random uh, determinations for how much rest there should be. And we've all done that. All of us have done that. Previous coaches, us as coaches, us as athletes probably as well. We want to do a better job of that through the uh, different chapters we go through over the course of this course, entire class to get a better understanding of how to apply these concepts more efficiently, more effectively for our athletes. Okay, Three basic terms you want to keep in mind at all times that are not technically in the text, but you should really be thinking about it at all times with your athletes. What's the most efficient thing, the most effective thing, and the safest thing I can do with my athletes right now? Now, safety is a high level of variability. Nothing's going to be perfectly safe. You step out your door, you could fall, right? But that said, we want to minimize unnecessary risks. We want to keep avoid those. Why do it? If we can't get the benefit from it, don't add more unnecessary risk. Don't say it's more challenging. Who cares if it's more challenging? Is it more efficient? Is it more effective? If it's not, who cares if it's more challenging? We've increased the risk. We've actually not increased the efficiency or effectiveness. That defeats the purpose. Ideally, an exercise in our given moment in time, we actually uh, design an exercise, proper work period, proper rest period, proper mechanical aspect or emotion to what we're actually engaging our performance. Uh, proper level of force output, proper level of RPE, rate of perceived exertion, proper level roughly heart rate wise, perfect world, proper level of blood levels, hormone response, all these things. It's so much going on in an exercise. If we do all those things, we're going to be the most efficient, most effective with the lowest possible risk. Safety, efficiency, effectiveness. Keep those terms in mind at all times. Hopefully I want to see those in your the discussion board posts as well. Now, that's the first week for general concepts. Make sure you've read through those chapters, 0, 1, and 2. Perform the Learn Smarts. 
And of course, uh, you've actually then gone to discussion board post post every week by Wednesday, the very, very latest, or you will lose points every single week. Okay. And of course, you'll have learn smarts have to be completed by Sunday. You have to be responding to each other as well by Sunday. Um, in addition to your first post, which is on Wednesday, keep in mind a few things. Pr primarily, or I should say, ideally, uh, I prefer you on Sunday, open up next week, the coming week, and take a look at what you're going to need to do, okay? On Sunday, if I were you, perfect world, I'd watch that welcome video, which would be, well, this case, this week, welcome, one welcome video, which is just under 20 minutes. And, of course, this week one video, which is now going to be right about 20 minutes as well. That's two videos. Every week, usually only one week, one video. And read your chapters. And if you can't, you can't. That's the goal. Monday or Tuesday, you start doing your Learn Smarts and start researching for your discussion board posts because you have to have at least one peer-reviewed research article cited and attached as a PDF or a direct link so I can, we can click on it. If it's not clickable, it's not in a PDF form, you're going to lose points. If it's not in APA, APA format, you're going to lose points every single week. Okay, Wednesday, make sure by midnight, 11.59 p.m. on Wednesday, your discussion board post is posted. Now, come Christmas week and New Year's week, uh, Christmas is actually on Tuesday. New Year's is actually on Tuesday. Uh, that said, or is it New Year's Day after two, on Tuesday? But, but I've already planned on, you can look forward to this in a few weeks, to not have to worry about your discussion board post by Wednesday. I will, however, give extra credit points for people who do post on Wednesday, right after Christmas, right after New Year's, but I'll give it to you Friday, those two weeks. Only those two weeks, which I believe is weeks uh, five and six, or four and five. But that said, every other week, make sure you always post by Wednesday or you'll lose points. Okay, and we lose the opportunity to be able to look over your posts enough to give you appropriate responses. You're going to get plenty of questions from me, and I expect you to answer those questions fully in order to get full points and to fully understand what we're trying to apply here, because the primary goal is real simple, isn't it? To get better as coaches. Why? To help our athletes more appropriately. How? Why? Because we want them to perform well, because we care about them and want to see them perform as the best as possible and not be limited by our limited capacity, because we want to be continually to try to increase our own capacity to help them. Okay, and of course, Thursday through Saturday, you come back and check in your discussion board posts. And on Sunday, um, start going with the next week. Look at the next week for what has to be done for that week. I still would like to see, ideally, go back on Sunday and maybe respond to a couple of people here and there. Most people don't. That's okay. But you're getting the most out of the course if you do that. I'm probably still going to respond to you up through Sunday. Most likely, most weeks, it'll be no later than Saturday a.m. Make sure you check those posts through your post through Saturday a.m., basically by noon on Saturday, at the very, very least, to respond to everything asked of you up to that point, or you will lose points. And we want to maximize the most we can get from every one of us, right? That's our goal. Well, it's a class, not just individual study. We want to maximize the interactions we have between each other. That said, call me, email me if you have questions today, tomorrow, anytime thereafter. I'm here for you. That's the whole purpose. My job is to help you as best I can to get the most misinformation to help your athletes, help you as a coach, maybe you as an athlete as well. I wish you all the best. Please stay in touch as much as you need to, and I will be in touch with you. You can guarantee that. We'll talk to you again soon.